at the uh, Emson lab, and I, I, I do uh, lead C-Brain. I'm uh, not a neuroimager or a neuroinformaticist, or I don't ask many neurology questions or anything about the brain, because it's, it's not my area of expertise, but I am an expert in uh, high-performance computing and how do we accomplish work uh, on big data and big computers. So today I'll tell you a little bit about C-Brain, uh, which we, is, is a platform for helping you to accomplish big uh, data and large-scale computational science. So what is C-Brain? Well, C-Brain is essentially an orchestration layer. So uh, it allows you to take a large amount of data, say you have a number of different neuroimages or pieces of data that you would like to process something on. You want to define one sort of thing that you want to do to that. And then it gives you a, a simple web interface, probably not as simple as a baby using it, but a pretty simple web interface. I'll show you that in a little bit. To say, I want to do this thing on all of this data. And then you hit go, and C-Brain essentially orchestrates everything and distributes it to a bunch of different supercomputing resources and cloud resources and data resources that we have available throughout the country. So um, it makes, it's, it's, it's attempting to try to make science, a big science, easier, manageable, and reliable. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about these different things uh, as we go along in the talk. So why should you consider using C-Brain? I know most of you are uh, either students or researchers here, and uh, you might be saying, you know, I already know how to do my, uh, I already know how to run my stuff, I already know how to use the command line, I know how to uh, do my research. And so here's just a couple of reasons why a platform like C-Brain, even if you are an experienced user of, of computing, uh, platforms and, res and, and resources, why it it's important. So uh, as part of C-Brain, you get access to big data and big computing. So we have over, at this point, over 600,000 processors available, and that's growing every, uh, every year, uh, allocated through C-Brain that we make available to researchers around the world and mostly in Canada and mostly at McGill, as well as also petabytes of high-speed storage. So this is giving you access to computing that you don't need and storage that you don't need to maintain or uh, uh, pay for. We, we essentially get it through grants uh, from uh, Compute Canada as well as some other places around the world. Uh, you want to do reproducible science, and uh, something like C-Brain and orchestration layer is a great thing uh, to look at because uh, you know reproducibility is a very tricky thing. And uh, a platform like C-Brain deploys our pipelines and our software in standard formats that run the same across a bevy of different resources, no matter what kind of uh, computing that you're doing. Um, it, 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 when you execute it on C-Brain with the same input parameters on the same data, it will give you the same answer, uh, whether you use uh, one resource or cloud or uh, you know, transfer it to China and uh, uh, process on it. It makes it uh, helpful. It also tracks provenance and uh, uh, records what your exact uh, parameters for everything uh, that you're doing is so that you can go back and reproduce that. Uh, it helps you scale up your science. So if any of you have ever tried to write uh, Bash scripts or Python scripts or uh, the number of uh, probably 500 different ways that people have figured out how to try to run things through a command line on a queuing system, um, that becomes very challenging. And it's not just about making it easier. It's, uh, like, it's not about just providing a web interface. That's, that's not really what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is provide it in an idiom that allows you to say, I want to do this science. That's our goal. It's not to say, I've given you something that doesn't mean you have to type ls on a command line. That's, that's not exciting. But to be able to say, here's all of my data and easily define that and then say, I want to do this to it and then do all the stuff underneath that makes it, you don't have to worry about that computing. That's what we're trying to accomplish. And so this helps you scale up the science. It helps you also take advantage of a high degree of parallelism. So we have automatic algorithms that move data into places that'll and, and divide up the computing uh, uh, in different ways to allow you to accelerate how, uh, time to solution for science. And also collaboration and sharing of your science. So Seabrain uh, is a virtual organization model. We have projects and we have people, um, users that collect together in projects. So uh, using Seabrain actually allows you to share data and collaborate with people around the world. So you can you know, set up your execution, run it, and then you get your results. You can actually then say, you know, uh, Tom over in France, hey, look at my results. The way it's just go to the web portal and you can share all those results. They can download them. They can uh, work with them and visualize them. 
And also, um, it's a way of making your pipelines and software available to others uh, in, a, in a way that's easy to maintain and, uh, and scalable. Uh, so if you're developing new pipelines for neuroimaging, or uh, for me, I was developing a supply chain model. I actually ported that to Seabrain. It's not unique to neuroimaging. Um, this is a great place for you to uh, put your tools so that other people can use them in a very defined and standard way. I know uh, I've been involved in de uh, deploying lots of uh, computational software over the years, uh, and some of them being really complex uh, simulation models that you don't want people to misuse. Um, and so it is challenging when you're deploying software, you don't know what people are going to do. This is a different way of doing that in that um, when you define, you put it in the C-Brain, it's really you're defining an execution through your program, not the program itself. So it's a much easier way to support your tool and an and execution model for your tool. So here are just some of the, the features of Seabrain. Uh, as I was saying, it's convenient and secure web access. We use everything through Secure Shell. Uh, everything's encrypted and we have uh, privacy and uh, permissions on all the data. So we can handle private data, we can control where it's at, we can control uh, how people uh, uh, share their tools, share their data. We can also open it up to the world and let them all have it. So it's, it's really up to the projects and we don't dictate that, we just provide the platform that allows people to do that. Um, distributed storage with automatic, uh, automated multi-point data movement and cataloging. Uh, we have a number of different storage devices within our ecosystem and Seabrain intelligently moves those uh, through that ecosystem. Transparent access to research tools and computing. Again, with a number of different computing resources, uh, you have transparent access to that. Um, it's flexible, you have a full audit trail so you can capture the provenance of all of your runs and uh, what's gone on with them. Uh, and then a couple other things like scalability, maintaining and sustainability of a research-based team, so you had a virtual organization model. But in a nutshell, it enables you to distribute and execute your software pipelines on a number of resources around the world, and then aggregates the data into a common view. So you don't really need to know where your files are. You just need to know they're in the Seabrain ecosystem and then you can access them. And then Seabrain tries to move them around intelligently. One of the biggest things nowadays with big data analytics, and if any of you have tried to download, say, the Human Connectome project to a computer here in the lab, you're realizing that you're you know, sucking uh, 70 terabytes of data through a coffee stirrer, and it takes forever to do that. So Seabrain prepositions things, puts it in your compute. Data movement is actually one of the biggest uh, factors in efficient computing. And also, uh, we take advantage of having that data there and more, multiple people doing multiple things on it so that we can reuse it so it's not moving around. Um, uh, uh, as much as possible. So our, our current ecosystem, and, and Joanne will be happy that I updated this slide um, wherever she's at, because uh, it's really hard to keep up with this slide. I need to make it like a live ticking thing, but we, this is a map of all of the different users that we have in the Seabrain ecosystem. One of the things that I don't like is that we don't have any users in Africa, so we're working on, on that now, but we have users in virtually every, every other continent. Um, and uh, uh, we have over 800 users uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, right now, about 350 of them are, uh, are active. We have uh, uh, people at 193 sites in 32 countries around the world. We've delivered over 40 million CPU hours of computing, and one million, we've distributed about 1 million files, um, probably more than that nowadays. Um, we're actually have an allocation now on Compute Canada that is in the order of petabytes to support the uh, Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform, and so we have plenty of uh, storage to, to utilize. Um, our development team consists of four full-time developers as well as a bunch of people around. Um, one of the unique things about Seabrain is, and it's one of the wonderful things and what drew me here to work on it is, is that we're not just building this stuff for the sake of building this stuff. Many infrastructure projects exist at like supercomputing centers where uh, you have a bunch of uh, geeks that are really interested in nothing but the architecture itself, but we sit in a scientific lab that's doing really world-class scientific work, as well as being at McGill University with a number of people uh, that are doing scientific work even outside of our, uh, our field of expertise. And that helps us to make sure that this architecture is for doing science, not for just the fact that we can move data around supercomputers. That's not really interesting. People have known how to do that for a long time. Uh, so our goal is to facilitate science, not to uh, just to build an infrastructure in, in a vacuum. And uh, so we have a number of different funding support and then collaborators uh, all around the world. And you can see 
Uh, since 2010, ooh, I gotta keep next to the microphone. Uh, since 2010, uh, we've grown very steadily in our user base and the number of uh, and number of resources and things that we have in the system. So most of our resources at this point come from Compute Canada. I don't know, my, many of you have probably interacted with Compute Canada. It's a very nice organization that provides uh, a, a lot of different computing resources. We have a node here at the uh, ATS. Uh, that's getting a new computer very soon called Beluga, um, which is going to be really big um, by, by Canadian standards. And that's, uh, so we have access essentially to this entire network of computers, which have a high speed connection between them, as well as a lot of computing resources. And so Seabrain sits uh, in front of this and we're giving, given these uh, resources as part of a, an allocation uh, through our CFI award. Um, so we're really thankful and uh, Compute Canada are very strong partners with uh, Seabrain. Uh, here's just an example. We have over 50 tools. Actually, we have over 60 now. And again, they're growing each day because we've, uh, we've uh, made it easier to put them in, which is both a blessing and a curse, because uh, now we get a lot more tools in there. But then we also have to support a lot more things. But it, uh, the good thing is we make it really standard. Um, so we're supporting, uh, right now, uh, Civet 2.1. This is sort of the place for external people to run Civet. Um, uh, I don't know exactly what it does, but I, I know some very intelligent colleagues that develop it, uh, like Lindsay, who's up in the top there. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful tool that we are happy to make uh, accessible through Seabrain. Uh, we also, a number of other tools like FSL, Free Surfer. Uh, we have the full Mink Tool Suite uh, there, uh, Ants, uh, NIAC. Also, we have, uh, as you can, as I was saying, we have a supply chain simulation model. Uh, uh, if you're really interested in trying that. We also have some genomics pipelines and uh, we're making a lot of new implementations for things like EEG analysis and visualizations and such. So um, we're growing, uh, growing by leaps and bounds uh, each day, uh, which is, is great. And uh, we're, we're trying to make it as much, even more easy for people to put their own tools in so that we're not the only ones that are, are doing this, uh, that uh, you generally won't need our help. And so. I'm going to go through, since this is sort of was supposed to be sort of a tutorial workshop thing, I'm going to sort of tell you how this is done and how we make it possible to move things through this ecosystem and do reproducible computing. And there are three major, three main components to how Seabrain works. So there's containerization, standardization, and orchestration. These are sort of the three levels of, of work that we do uh, to make uh, in the Seabrain architecture. So, um, how many of you have used, say, Docker or Singularity to, to port your tools? Okay, number of people, good. Okay, so um, if, you, if you've ever tried to install um, uh, software, I mean, uh, so there's probably, I'm guessing if I said how many of you are using Windows, that would not be, that would not be a high number here. But uh, how, many, uh, how many of you are using Macs? And how many of you are using Linux machines? Okay, and how many of you have installed the same thing on both of those? And it's a pain in the butt, isn't it? Uh, it's so different libraries, different tools, different operating systems, containerization sort of solves that. I'm not gonna say it solves it completely, but what it essentially does is it tries to make this, uh, this uh, the, the, the task of deploying and uh, tools on different computing environments easier by instead of you installing your software on actual hardware, you're installing it into a lightweight virtual machine. So um, it's very similar. In fact, if you're running, like say Docker or Singularity on your, um, your uh, Mac laptop, you're actually running something like uh, VirtualBox. So it's very much like virtual machines, but it's a lighter weight layer that then also allows you to interact with the in a standard way with the rest of the resources of the system. So you can, instead of it like only providing you a big file system for your own stuff, it allows you to connect to the file systems inside the computer. And it's also immutable. So you don't really, once you've made it, users don't change it. They just use it. So it can actually be used like an executable almost. So if I say install, uh, and if any of you have installed Mink Tools or Civet, I mean, I've, I've installed uh, software on computers that were not actually, they were like serial number one, like the public didn't have access to them, and I can't install Mink Tools and Civet at the moment. Um, it's very challenging because it has a lot of external packages uh, uh, and a lot of dependencies. And so when somebody changes the operating system, that makes, it's a big deal. It takes a lot of effort for us to change that software. Instead, what we do is we install it into a virtual image 
and then that uh, that is a file of uh, in the case of singularity which is the the technology that we're allowed that we use on uh, compute canada it's essentially a file that's got a tag called simg it's an image so if i want to share civet with you on a singularity image i just send you the file and you if singularity is installed on your computer or any computer you can run it you run it just like you would run the command line, except you put singularity exec or singularity run at the front of it. And then you don't have to install it at all. It's already installed for you. It doesn't need to interact with the system libraries or anything. Singularity or Docker takes care of that for you. Um, you've probably heard of Docker and Singularity. Singularity is what we use mostly, although they're kind of interchangeable when you're developing the containers. But uh, when you're on high performance computing resources or shared resources, there are a lot of security issues with Docker. Um, so that's why Singularity is a, a much better technology for using shared environments. But um, uh, e either way is, is fine as long as you end up with a Singularity image at the end because that's what uh, we can use to uh, run on Compute Canada and other resources. So the next component is standardization. Um, so uh, you know, if I want to provide a platform that tells me how to execute somebody else's software, the last thing I want to do is make it ambiguous how I run that software. I want to standardize it as much as possible. I want to have something that tells me exactly what the command line parameters mean, what types they are. What, uh, what order they go in, uh, uh, because uh, it's frankly the Wild West out there. Um, uh, and if you've tried to uh, install things that now with Python and uh, Perl, uh, they all have different syntax. And then MATLAB, God forbid you want to run MATLAB from the command line. Um, these are all, they all have different syntax, and it's all very difficult for you to figure out, for anyone to figure out how all these work and there's loads of documentation. Well, if we have a standard that tells us exactly what goes into the command line to do the execution that we want to do, then we don't have that problem. And so we work with um, Tristan Glitar over at uh, Concordia University who started a project, he used to be a developer in the Seabrain team, he started a project called Boutiques, which uh, provides a JSON standard for this. So you basically develop a text-based file that says, what are all the inputs? What's the command line that I want to run? Define all those inputs. Is it a number? Is it a, uh, an integer or a float? Is it a file? And all of these things go together, and then you can validate that command line so that it becomes very standard and easy to reproduce and deploy tools across different platforms because we know exactly what it is we're trying to run. Um, so a lot of people around here talk about metadata and standardization of data. Uh, well, programs are essentially just data that's creating more data. And so this kind of standardization is very key to us being able to you know, reproduce exactly the same execution every time. And it also gives us a tool to automatically deploy things in, within the architecture. Um, and so th I just put some of these, uh, and I'm happy to share these slides afterwards. I don't know, I didn't know if there was a place to put them before, but I saw a couple people taking pictures. I can give you the slides. You, you, don't, have to, you don't have to keep taking pictures. Um, there's, nothing, there's no animation, so it's not going to be exciting. Um, uh, but the, you can, uh, there's a, a website to show you how to do this, and then you can contribute on GitHub. There are other standards as well. I mean, there are, there's, this has been around for a while. There's like um, CWL, which is Common Workflow Language, which is an Apache project that does something similar to this. Um, and so there, the, this, but this is the one that we work with just because we, we like JSON and we also like Tristan. Um, but it gives us well-defined, reproducible, and most importantly, machine-readable. And this is also a part of why we standardize data and metadata is because we need it to be machine readable. Analytics, I mean, um, uh, most of the knowledge of, of, of science is caught up in 3,000 word PDFs that it takes a team of graduate students to uh, reinterpret for people uh, over and over again and then fill out some text file that has the parameters in it. Uh, what we really need is for these things to be in a machine readable format so that we can input them into different analytics uh, easily. And so making the command line, um, you would think that making the command line machine readable is like, duh, it's in a machine. But uh, there are so many different variants of this, it's very important. And uh, just to let you know, Boutiques is not just um, uh, a, a JSON standard, it's a whole ecosystem kind of like containers where uh, they're making now a repository of boutique descriptors. So eventually, anyone that's making a command line, or I mean, if you're using someone else's tool and you want to make a descriptor for your command line, you can do that and you can push it to their repository and then you can share it with others so that they can reproduce uh, the, 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 the work that you're doing as well. So it's a, it's gonna, it's a nice way to deploy tools across uh, different architectures. 
So, and finally, the, the meat of what a C brain does is orchestration. So, orchestration is us moving the data around, us performing the computation. So, every one of these computing resources has a different environment. Uh, no matter how much they try to homogenize them, uh, like in Compute Canada, there is an effort to make all of the computers look the same. Uh, it's not very successful because it's just, there's just so many differences between high performance computers. Um, and cloud resources now also uh, don't necessarily have common interfaces. Um, and so the orchestration layer allows us to take and abstract away things like queuing systems, file systems, uh, environment setup and things like that. We put that, that's all built into our system so that you, once we have a container, once we have a boutique descriptor, you can essentially just tell the system, I want to execute uh, on my data this boutique descript or this, this execution pipeline and it sends it off through the network and, uh, and to our remote resources layer and then off to remote resources to be able to, uh, uh, to execute. And we have something, a uh, user facing layer which is our web portal which actually um, at this point we're re redoing. Uh, we're going to be making a new more dynamic uh, web interface. Uh, if anybody has any suggestions about how you would like to interact with your data and computing, we're happy to hear it. Um, we're taking, we're kind of in the user development phase now, so uh, we'd like to make it very useful and dynamic for people. And so this is, this is sort of our full-blown uh, uh, architecture description of Seabrain. Uh, so Seabrain orchestration layer essentially consists of three layers. Hopefully this, uh, this works in. Um, so we have the user-facing layer, which has a the, the web client, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and then we also have a RESTful API interface. So one of the things that we've worked very hard over the last uh, year, as well as being part of some of these interoperability wor uh, working groups uh, and, and projects like COMP, um, is to make our tool a back-end to things. So now people with a RESTful API, which is a way for, for those of you that don't know what that that is, it's like a way of defining URLs uh, that you can then interact with the whole system. So you can build your own user interface or have your own tools uh, interact with Seabrain without having to go through our web client. So it's now making accessible the orchestration layer of Seabrain to a whole new community that they can develop their own interfaces and things on top of uh, and take advantage of the other uh, backend resources we have. And so then when, once, once we get to the back end, uh, laser pointer, there we go. Um, so it goes through the, uh, the network. Um, this sets on a, a web server at the uh, ETS, and we have a backup server somewhere. Um, uh, you go through the network, and then there's the Seabrain portal, which is not really the web interface. It's a set of tools that we deploy uh, that provide the web interface, provide different features of Seabrain, basically how the rest of the world interacts with the back end re remote resources. And we have a metadata. Uh, database, which is a MySQL database that stores all of the information about Seabrain, all of the jobs that are run, all the tool configurations, all the users, um, is all stored in our metadata database. Um, and so we have, uh, like this is the layer that does authentication, it, it translates the, uh, the API calls to uh, actual execution, we have some visualization services, and it also produces the, uh, the browser. And then finally, there's a remote resources layer. This is where all of the different, this laser point's not working. Uh, this is where all of the, uh, the resources sit. So where we have all of our high performance computers, our data providers, data providers, what we call um, uh, different file systems and databases that we can access. And then we have a layer that's called an execute, the execution controllers. That's what interacts with the high performance computers. And so uh, once you've defined work, it moves, once you define work through the interface or through the API, it moves through the system, executes on the resources. Seabrain manages all of that for you. It tells you whether things fail, whether they succeed. Um, that may seem, again, may seem trivial. You know, you can, you can uh, SQ your, uh, I'm sorry, I'm still getting used to Slurm. Uh, you could SQ on Gram and see if your job's still running or fail. But imagine if you're running one million of those at one time. That becomes a bit challenging. And so Seabrain is the type of architecture that allows you to, instead of running one at a time and maintaining that or continually checking, it will allow you to, to uh, run you know, thousands or millions of jobs at one time and keep track of all of them. It helps you restart them. We have fault tolerance, so you can restart jobs that fail and you can keep track and get everything that, uh, uh, that happens throughout that execution. So uh, it provides a lot of different things that make it easier for you to do the, the computing itself. 
So I'll just give you a quick demo of uh, Seabrain. Uh, now I'm gonna, I'll, I'll preface this with the, the, what I'm gonna do in Seabrain is not what I would refer to as highly exciting because if I do something highly exciting, it will take a long time uh, because these programs take, no matter how much I try to parallelize things, it's still gonna take like a day to run a free surfer. Even if I'm running a thousand of them, I could run a thousand of them in one day, but I can't run one more than more faster than that. So what we're going to do, I'm going to show you the architecture. I'm going to show you how, with a simple uh, execution, we can do some parallel computing. I'm going to convert a mink file to a nifty file. So a very simple operation, but you'll you'll see what um, what we can do. So I'm uh, let me find my mouse here. There we go. Um, well, this is going to be interesting and challenging with me looking up there while trying to navigate. Um, so this is what you're presented when you uh, log into Seabrain. Uh, so I am you know, my user, uh, Sean Brown, and you get a summary of the different things that you've run. So you can see that I have tested the ever-loving crap out of this demo uh, over the day. So you know that I've run it like 15 times. Uh, and so uh, this, is, this is just what you're presented with all the files that you've updated and all the tasks that you run in your account information. So we're gonna, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and uh, select a project. So if I click over here on projects, you see these are all the projects that my user belongs to. And some of these can be, some people have, you know, 100 of these things. Uh, so it, it depends on what you're doing. But each one of these for me is a project that I'm working on that's a collection of people that I interact with within that project. And so I've, uh, set up one uh, called Seabrain Demo that allows me to run this demo. So I'm gonna select that project. And what this does is it, it narrows down Seabrain, the interface to Seabrain to all the files, users, and tasks and stuff that are accessible to this project. So you don't have to have the whole of Seabrain shown to you all at once. It allows you to interact in this sort of uh, d diminished space for uh, the project. So in this, this particular project, I have three I've, I've gone to the files interface. I have three files that I'm looking at. I have three basically uh, mink files that are of some sort of imaging. I'm sure that if I, if I click on it, I will, it will actually, we have some visualization services. This is a brain browser, can show you. You can actually uh, look around, play with it. You all probably know way more about what I'm doing here than I am on, on when I'm, as I'm moving this mouse, although I, I, can, I get 3D images. Um, but this is uh, available, and we can also connect this to any sort of data. Um, uh, you know, any kind of data type can have a visualization tool associated with it that we can import into the, um, in the Seabrain. Now, this is part of the web interface, so this is not available through the API services, but um, it's something that we provide for, uh, for instance, for if I run a, a number of jobs and I want to do QC on what I get from the analysis pipeline, you can run through these quickly and just even uh, uh, scroll through or like, uh, tap through your images and you can start looking at the, the images to make sure that you know nothing bad has happened or um, uh, you can see that it's not, uh, for in my case I was trying to do a Lego phantom pipeline and I can see that one of the images was a Lego phantom and three of the images were still human brains. So that was not the data set that I wanted. Um, uh, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the files so um, I'm going to go ahead and launch this task. So I, I have three files. This could be like I have a, a, a thousand of these, which is not actually that uncommon. Um, I want to convert all of these at once to, uh, uh, to Nifty files because I need, say, Nifty for uh, uh, one of the pipelines I'm doing. So instead of you know, doing one at a time, I could select all three of these files and then say launch. And then I'm brought up to a, a near face here that tells me which pipeline. So you can see all the pipelines that this project and myself have available to me. The one that we're gonna use here is uh, the Mink to Nifty thing. And for fun, we're going to actually ship this to Texas to run. So we're gonna ship, we're gonna take this to the United States to run at uh, the TAC uh, Computing Center. Um, now, TAC is, has a computer called Stampede, which is the largest supercomputer for academic computing in the world. Uh, it's actually larger at this point because it's Texas. It's larger than all of the computers in Canada combined. Because, you know, God forbid Texas has a reasonable size computer. Uh, but it's a very nice computer and uh, we are actually a node on their, their network uh, as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and click launch. And then I'm presented with an interface. Now this is a, a tool that is uh, provided through the, the mechanisms I told you about um, 
with uh, you know, defining, standardizing what the input parameters look like. And because I've standardized the input parameters, I actually can you know, provide you a web interface that says, here are all the parameters that you can change or tune for this pipeline. In this case, it's uh, you know, a couple, just only a couple parameters because we're doing a conversion. So I always let the program choose because I don't know which one to do. And then I'm gonna, I want an output format of uh, nifty. And then we have some other things that we could set up here. So I could, instead of uh, you know, keeping my files on the same data provider or the same file system, I could move it all around the system. So I could convert the, if I have these all here in McGill and I wanna take them to Texas uh, and convert them there, I could convert them and then the end result could be shipped off to Texas so that when I do my next stage of processing, they're already there and I'm ready to go. Um, in this case, we'll just leave them here, but, uh, but you can see you can have some quite a bit of flexibility in how you uh, define the execution. So now I'm just going to go ahead and say start mink uh, to N uh, NII. Um, one of these is the new one. Ah, here we go. Uh, you'll see here is the new, the new tool. And I didn't just uh, submit one job. It submitted three independent jobs to the machine together. Now, Again, I'm, this is not exciting because I'm just converting three files. But if I had a thousand of these, each of these are going to run independently of each other. Each of them are submitted to the resource. They can run whenever there's available resources, so they can take advantage of uh, uh, copious amounts of computing that are available. And they all are also checked for error handling themselves. So if you have a, I, 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 at least in my minute experience with like large uh, neuroimaging data sets, I know there are a lot of you know, pipelines that you run on things and not all of the files in the, in the data set are of a high quality, you can actually run them all, see which ones failed, and then go back and see what the issues were with those. And then you can just restart those. You, so they're all independent and they're all tracked and they're all the same uh, sort of thing. We're actually, if any of you have uh, uh, heard of uh, BIDS, I'm sure many of you have heard of BIDS. Uh, I'm the only one that's a, a troglodyte when it comes to neuroimaging. Um, we actually have been um, looking at uh, providing more robust services through BIDS. So this is a BIDS data set that I downloaded off of Open Neuro. And you know, we have a BIDS validator that you can do here. But this is what a, the directory structure looks like. And we're actually making tools now that allow you to say, OK, I have a BIDS data set, and I want to do this thing on a BIDS data set. It will then launch it all in parallel for you without you having to do uh, anything additionally, or you can you can say I only want to do it on certain things. So we're trying to make it even easier for people as standards uh, evolve to to do the computation in a much more efficient and easy way. Um, so uh, we can go back to uh, oh I want to go back to my project and check on the tasks. So uh, you can see I can I can do all sorts of other, this is all independent. So once I've shipped these off, Seabrain is managing it for me. I don't have to sit there and watch it. I don't have to keep my computer on. I can go get coffee. I can you know watch uh, Netflix or whatever. I can turn it off. And you just come back because it's all on the web and it's all, uh, it's all um, managed through the Seabrain ecosystem. So you don't have to actually uh, pay attention to it until it's done. Uh, I, just to show you a couple of things, but while I'm waiting for those jobs to run, um, you see here are all the compute services or the servers that we have currently in the ecosystem. Uh, some of them are offline or not accessible. This one in China, um, this is with a project that we have called the CCC Access. It's in Chengdu. Um, uh, it actually, for some reason, disconnects every seven hours, almost on the nose. Um, so we're still trying to figure out why that is. Uh, uh, it's a very long distance connection, so that's a very challenging thing to keep something like that open. But um, we have the, the big uh, Compute Canada resources. We have some local resources as well uh, to do some uh, quicker things and, and such. And we are, we're growing the resources, as I said, every day. We'll be, uh, we've added Ni Ni uh, Ni Ni um, sorry, Niagara and Beluga will be coming online soon as well as we're working with more US centers to add uh, computing resources. And then uh, data providers, we have a number of different places you can store data. Um, we have some that are project specific, some that are you know, generic. Um, and Seabrain manages all of the file movement through there. We also can support uh, some new modes. Uh, they're not, well, one of them is new. One of them is not really new. It's been around for a while, but it's new to us. 
uh, we also can do S3 providers, so you can define your Amazon cloud services or anything that is using an S3 interface. S3 is not unique to Amazon. You can use it for a number of different other resources uh, for object stores. And then uh, we also have a new data provider for Datalad. So if any of you have heard of that, it's a way of defining metadata and searching through metadata and pulling data through Git Annex. Um, and so we can, uh, it's being used by some projects like Open Neuro in the States, and we can now pull data in through that. I'm working on pulling in the Abide data for Nikhil to, to do that um, uh, through the Data Lab provider. So we can, we're very flexible in how we can define resources and stuff. And we, you can see I got a message while we were doing that. My job's finished successfully, so I will click on this and see, oh, those are all the messages. So we'll go back to, uh, oh, actually I wanted to go back to files. And see, now I have, since, I, since my job is, all three of those jobs have ran, they were submitted. They were literally shipped over to Texas, submitted on the Texas computer, completed, and, those, and because I defined it in a certain way, the files were shipped back here to McGill and made available. And all that time that we were talking and all I had to do was basically define the input parameters. And it took care of it all for me. And if you uh, click on one of these, uh, it's a nifty file, so you can use Brain Browser uh, accepts nifty files as well, and so we can actually uh, do visualization on those files. We can port those to another, um, uh, another pipeline uh, if we want and uh, continue to work on them. Um, sometimes I wait, sometimes I don't. Yep, there we go. Um, so there you go, so you can see uh, within the time that we were talking, that we did, now you can imagine again that if this were civet run, that would take uh, I don't know how long, probably a couple of days, even even three jobs. How long is Civet? Like a four to six hours, okay. But you could do, the, the, the power is that you could do a thousand of those in four to six hours because we have so much computing available, which is really nice. Um, so that's the, the demo I wanted to show you. I'll go back to the presentation, if I can figure out how to use my Mac. I should try to be more stylish because I know that uh, Joanne's taping is and the world will see me uh, fumbling through my talking. Um, so um, I hope that was a, that at least uh, showed you what we can do with Seabrain. There's a lot more power to it, so um, I'm gonna give you some pointers on how to connect to it, but uh, here's a paper that we published in uh, 2014 uh, with a number of different authors. I'm relatively new to the project compared to everyone that's been a part. This has been a, essentially been around since about 2009, so it's one of the older um, projects in this space, uh, and it's it's been around that long, and which is means that it's it's actually pretty good. Many of these, there have been a lot of efforts that to do similar type things, they come and go very quickly. Seabrain's been around for the the long haul, and so it's uh, it's been a very stable and uh, 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 very easy to use system that people have found useful. So we hope that continues. Uh, so if you want to learn more about the architecture, you can read the paper. Um, if you want to get involved in development or uh, also, the we provide the documentation at this point through GitHub. You can fork us on GitHub. Uh, it's an open project. Anyone can download any of the source. Um, I will warn you, it's in Ruby on Rails, so, uh, which is probably not something that many of you get training on. But if you're a Python programmer, uh, you have some experience with uh, some uh, MVC type models or some, it's really not that hard to learn. I, I, when I got here a year and a half ago, I knew nothing about Rails and now I can program in Rails, but I was a Python programmer. So it's, it's very similar to that. Things like uh, actually GitHub and uh, uh, Hulu and things, those are still built on Ruby on Rails. Uh, so uh, Ruby is actually uh, still really widely used. And so we, we've, uh, there are a lot of features for the Rails system that make it very easy to manage. And then finally, if you would like to become a user, uh, it's very easy. Uh, uh, I wouldn't even say you have to be a McGill person. You can be anybody and go to our website, our portal that we provide here through McGill free of charge. You can just sign up for an account and that will start giving you access to the services. Uh, much in the same way that I was just showing you there, you can start uploading your files, you can start executing pipelines, see what's available. And uh, uh, you can access the support team through the portal. We have a, a discourse uh, chat uh, uh, program that you can uh, you know, message us and, and get support as well as um, if you're here at McGill, you can go over to the really um, dilapidated house that's connected to this thing and see all of our team. That's where we live is in the house behind here, uh, 527. And I do want to acknowledge a lot of the support 
uh, that we've gotten over the years from uh, uh, for funding support from Canary and Lud the Ludmer Center, um, as well as you know we're a part of the neuro and uh, the labs. And I don't know why that. Uh, there we go. Um, we've received a lot of good support from, and also again acknowledge Compute Canada, which has given us a lot of really uh, good support. And here is the, the team. Uh, that's not just developers. We we are not just, as I said before, we have about four full-time developers. That's not counting me because they don't consider me a developer anymore. Um, and so, but we have a number of other people that work with our team to ensure that we're doing good science. And so, I want to acknowledge all of them. And of course. We all sit in Alan Evans' lab, who is the, uh, the person that really sort of spearheaded making uh, uh, an academic group that does a lot of infrastructure, which is kind of unique, uh, uh, in, at least in my experience around the world. So uh, with that, I thank you for listening, and I'll take any questions if you have them. PJ. Not, um, not to my knowledge. Uh, it's uh, it's the, the limits, not the number of jobs. It's more the resources that we have available through the system. Um, so once uh, it may, I mean, it may take a little bit of time to launch all of those things. But once they're launched, they all sort of work independently of each other. There there have been times where we've had ten. 10,000 or even like 50,000 jobs running through the system at the same time. That's not really an issue, but again, we, we don't have infinite resources to run things, so you, know, you still have to wait for those jobs to run, but you'll have to do that anyway. If you're doing that manually on your own one computer in Compute Canada, it'd be a lot more laborious process. So, but to, to my knowledge, we don't really have a, a, a number of task bottleneck. The, the system's pretty robust. Um, it, we, we also have a very big, we have, I mean, that's because we also have a very big server that's running it, so it's more of a memory thing in that case. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so the way that we, the, 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 I mean, this gets into a little bit of the lower level details, but um, the, the architecture that we've decided to use is that we actually deploy compute servers on each of the machines that can run uh, independently. So if like say the portal goes down, that doesn't affect the running jobs. We just bring the portal back up and everything still keeps running. If one of those compute servers go down, um, it will more than likely, unless it's in the middle of setting up a job, it won't affect them. If they're submitted to the queue, since the, the state is saved in a, a database, we can actually, uh, even if those jobs finish or fail while the server's down, once it starts back up, it just repings all the jobs and gets the job status, and you can do whatever you want. So it's it's actually very robust. I mean, the the, the senior developer is very concerned about these things, so he makes sure that everything like that works. So uh, uh, when you're dealing with this sort of distributed network of computing, it is things go down a lot. It's just the nature of the business, and so we we'll, even if a computer goes down, we can restart things. A, a new because we have the state saved in a database somewhere that's not on the computer. So, mm -hmm. how did you guys extend the operational operations? Like, so, did you just do like five hundred computers? I'm I'm sorry, I don't understand. Extending the operational operations and like the ones that are required to keep certain you know ah. operating systems running at the time. Right. That's a, it's a, it's a really good question. It's not really the use case that this type of tool was designed to do, but um, it can do it. It's just that those are then, at the moment, those would be like two separate pipelines. So you could run something, look at it, have, have a human inter intervention, look at the outputs. You know, we serve up the visualization for those kind of, that kind of uh, activity. And then you can launch things. I, I know this is there's a, there's a lot of manual QC processes that people do. So you can uh, you can then relaunch the ones that have passed QC. Um, another thing that we're doing is for tools like Loris that do managed you know data collection, multi-center data collection and curation. We're making it now easier to. Uh, we've always been able to do it, but we're making it now very uh, transparent to be able to launch pipelines. Uh, from Loris, and so they can, you know, put that in the process of actually collecting and curating the data as well in that same interface. So um, that's that's how we do it now. But it, it really, the it's not the primary use case that we we've done. So like, if you're running a pipeline, 
if you're running a pipeline and you have to have a human look at it in the middle of the pipeline, it's challenging regardless to ship that off to supercomputing without dividing up all of your tasks into what a computer can do and what, a, uh, what, the, the, um, uh, what the person has to do. Um, it, it, yeah, you can get it as a text file. Um, it's, it's stored in the system. Uh, it's always stored in the database as well. Um, and one, one thing you can do, not, not just the text file, but you could actually, if you're working in a project in the system, you literally just give them the link to the task and they can access all of that information to, for them uh, themselves as well. And the files that were used to run it. So, um, uh, if I go back to, uh, finding my mouse. Um, there it is. If I look at the uh, the the task page uh, for the completed, uh, was it this one? I think it was the one that we ran. So these are all going to be independent tasks. So each one of these were a uh, separate task. You actually have like links to the the files that you use as input. Uh, the files used as output. It does not necessarily a file. I don't want to say we call them user files, but it's more of a data packet. So this could be a bids data set or a directory of files. Yeah, but they're all linked there. You can get um, uh, the whole you know history of what was run there. Um, and there is a, a summary, and then there's a raw thing which gives you actually the input parameters you have. Um, and then the API actually gives you back this in a structured JSON format. So yeah, you can get those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Um, I want to say yes, but I mean, we, we have, we have that, we don't make it available to the users at this point. Um, but we are working on, I mean, right now you do have to sort of choose the resource that you want to submit. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing over the next year is try to add something what we refer to in the business as meta scheduling. So that instead of you saying, I want to submit free, this free surfer job to Graham. You say, I want to submit a free surfer job, and then Seabrain tries to find the best resource that's available the most to run it on. Uh, that is, there's a lot of challenges to that. Uh, I've, I've worked in at least two national computing uh, infrastructure projects that have tried to do that and not been successful. So we'll probably add something that's a bit not trying to do everything for everyone. Uh, but uh, that's the best way to do that. Um, we do have monitoring tools that allow us to check what people, you know, what, what the resources. And we do, when you, if you notice when we, um, uh, I'll, I'll show you again. We do provide a little bit of information to the, uh, the user about this. If I go to uh, mink.ni and I choose uh, TAC, I actually give you a readout of how long the la uh, how some heuristical measurement of how long it should take to get your job on there. And if I uh, did this for let's see something I know I have on um, uh, Graham or see, let's see that. Um, this is not a measure an estimate of how long it would take to run Civet. It's a how long it takes to get to the queue. So it's right now on a uh, Cedar. It's looking like it's taking about six minutes to get something queued up. And running. Compared to doing practical uh, supercomputing, is there any way to benchmark your results to make sure it's not as? De depends on what you want to. What do you What do you mean by? I mean, yeah, there's there's lots of ways to benchmark. You mean, uh, do you want to get like memory and CPU usage? I mean, like instrument instrument benchmarking. 
chapter or not, mm -hmm. you can use the, the, the variable who is what chapter. And maybe if you organize your data in the better mm -hmm. sections and in this chapter and in this paper, uh, how can you not improve? Sure, sure. Yeah, and I've done that. I, I know what you're talking about because, uh, like, uh, in in other more lower level distributed computing systems, I've you know tried to. I've actually printed out like I was running uh, seventy thousand flu model jobs. I actually printed out the rate at which the jobs were finishing on the thing. I was uh, trying to jack it up as fast as I could go, which was fun. Um, uh, eventually, I mean, we don't necessarily allow that lowest that low of a level of control over how the jobs are distributed. Eventually what we like to do is be able to have something intelligently do that for people. So we would probably, the, the, the right answer is we would work with you to figure out what the best way to do that is, how to estimate the right read. Because that all comes down to estimating how long it takes to run one job in that sort of distributed computing system. Try to have a good estimate for that because it has to fit into the queuing system. Uh, and uh, any Q prediction algorithm requires you to know at least at some level how, or the, an order of magnitude, how long a job will take to run. Like if you, uh, the, the classic problem with queuing, uh, high performance computing queuing systems is that I tell you, you can run for seven days, that's the limit, and everybody submits it for seven days because I don't want it to die because I didn't give it the time. But if I'm running a queuing system, that gives me no information about the job. And so then I have to sample the system running, and so that, then requires us to, now with, with Seabrain, we can keep a lot of those heuristics and then we can use that as, that's planning what we're planning on doing is keeping those heuristics of everything that's run, how long it sat in the queue, how long it took to run, um, and some estimate of how big the input resources are and then use that as a prediction algorithm to try to distribute the computing in an intelligent way. Just one more thing. Sure. Uh, do, you, do you plan to, to like find or something to recognize if someone really did all the work? Um, I hadn't, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that, but it's a, I, 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 I mean, I could give you a Starbucks card or something. <laughs> I mean, we're providing this stuff for free, man. We don't have a lot of money to, to give you like Starbucks cards and stuff. But no, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, a hearty pat on the back maybe, or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, I mean, we have lots of, I mean, a lot of different data sets. Uh, I mean, the, too many to tell you exactly everything. Um, we have, uh, there's, there's some HCP data on there. There's some uh, bids data sets. Uh, uh, just the, mostly people bring their own data sets to it. Um, whether it's available to everybody or not is a matter of the, is a function of the data set, not us. We can make it available for anyone to compute on that we want. Uh, th that's, but the system also has the ability to narrow it down because many of these data sets um, uh, uh, and the work that people are doing, you know, you can't make it available to everybody. But we have, we do have the capability of like say, put HTTP on there that's, uh, or, or a data set that's open, and HTTP is not exactly open, but something that everybody can use and make that available to everyone and they can just go use it. That is, that is possible, that, that, that is something we can do. Mm -hmm. Um, no, we don't, we don't, we don't, uh, necessarily facilitate that. We could, you could do that, uh, but we don't, we don't currently do that now. You would probably have to do some sort of hashing algorithm to, on the output to make sure, because you have to not only make sure that you ran it with the exact same input parameters, but you got the same output. Uh, and some, some pipelines, like the ones that I would run that are stochastic may not give you the exact same answer every time, things like that. So. It could be done. Uh, we don't. We don't. But uh, we don't provide that at the moment. We don't cache the results or anything like that to to serve them up. I mean, there's a lot of projects. I know I worked in a malaria project where that was primarily what we were planning on doing, like a big data hypercube thing that did a hashing table for that. Um, one of the things that we one of the things that we can do with Data Lad as we're integrating more with Data Lad is. Uh, once we, uh, right now what we've done is we've got the input side of Data Lad. We can pull data sets in from Data Lad and we're working on the export data sets to Data Lad. That would then help facilitate something like that and that you would, the Data Lad would just like a git annex uh, type thing. You would be attaching the metadata to a taggable thing that then you could say, okay, when I run this, I can take that information and 
check against data lads metadata did i already run this and then just pull the result depending on where the data is that may be faster or slower than actually rerunning it which is also a classic problem of computing is that sometimes moving data is more expensive than rerunning things but Any other questions? JB, any questions about metadata? Um, <laughs> <laughs> metadata? <laughs> Yeah, so the final words would be is that this is, uh, so Seabrain is one part of our ecosystem. It's, it's really the compute side of things. We have Loris, which is the data side of things. Um, and uh, what we're hoping is that these tools are also now becoming part of an ecosystem of community-driven tools out there to be able to you know, enhance the way people are doing science. So uh, there's a lot of exciting projects out there. It's a great time to be a, compu a computational scientist. Um, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation, and uh, there is wine and cheese afterwards, so enjoy. Thanks. So I wanted to thank Sean for giving us that presentation. We also taped it. <laughs> and we'll be putting it on the website eventually.